All good. <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome. Um, my name is Joyce Garzinski. I'm the Assistant University Librarian for Communications and Digital Scholarship here at, uh, at Cook Library. And uh, I'd like to welcome you to our uh, workshop here today, talking about textbook adoptions. Um, this workshop is a collaboration of lots of different units on campus um, who um, focus on and work with different parts of the textbook um, adoption ecosystem. Um, and so I'd like to thank um, FACET and uh, especially um, Trish and Paul for their collaborations um, and putting this workshop together, as well as um, Stacy at the Youth Store. Thank you so much um, for being uh, a part of this workshop today. Uh, as well as uh, a number of our librarians who are participating today. So here's our agenda. Um, first, we're going to get started with uh, a little bit of discussion and some questions. Um, then Stacy's going to talk about the use store process. Um, Trish is going to talk about facets role, the low and no cost designation and um, other supports for faculty. Um, Rick Davis, who is our copyright librarian, um, is gonna talk about library supports and textbook lending and uh, a database called Faculty Select. Miranda, our publishing and open scholarship librarian, is gonna talk about copyright and some other publishing um, aspects related to textbooks. And um, Brittany Ballard, who is our I hope I get this right, Learning Technologies Librarian, um, is going to talk about H5P and um, how, how you can use this uh, platform in developing content. So we've got a lot of uh, expertise in the room today when it comes to textbooks and course books. So to get us started, I have a question for all of you. How much does the average textbook cost? What do you think? If you're online, feel free to put it in chat. 35 bucks. 35, yeah. 120. 120? I'm going to say 75. 75? That's a 160. 160? I think 120. I'm sorry, 120. 90 bucks. Trick question. <laughs> the average textbook, 105. So, yeah, 105.37. And on average, students spend a little over $1,200 per year on textbooks. So, this is more of a discussion based question. So, if you're a faculty member, what goes into your decisions about what textbooks to assign? What do you what are you thinking about? And where do you go to 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 get textbooks? The content is the main thing that I look for in discovering the subjects I need to cover. Content, sure. The, the, least objectionable material <laughs> meaning that not 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 my student just you know when you go through a textbook and you, and you go well this isn't right oh this is crap <laughs> then you, you don't want to sign that even if the other parts are are pretty good you try and find something that, that that's because you, you won't if it's a textbook then somebody has expertise in some area but not another area the textbook is not going to be Evenly terrific, it's going to have good parts and it's not good parts. So. Anyone else want to share? Are you all relying on textbook reps to suggest content, or how do you find out about? new materials in your area um what goes into that piece of it 
I'm guessing the reps used to be helpful 20 years ago. Maybe <laughs> no, I don't even know. I guess we still have them. But there's usually there's they send an email. And it's yeah. one. I heard, had a conversation with one. Doesn't yeah, matter. Well. 10 years. A as well. That's yeah. why you don't see them. Well, also, they're, 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 right. they're, they're much more about, you know, what educational products can we sell you? I mean, it's, it, it's, it's that, that, that's really all it is now. There, there's no pretense of, of you know, you're, you're teaching for, for book publishers. Now they're, they're simply content sellers. Any, if you have thoughts online, feel free to unmute and just jump in. For professional organizations, okay. Good to know. Good to know. I have to look for colleagues whose work I already know. And our last question, what impact do you think textbook adoptions have on students? So I just want to say um, from, from our perspective, since we sell a vast majority of the textbooks, um, the complaints that I get from students are usually if the textbook that's chosen is not used, um, they don't care whether it's $35 or $125. If it's needed for the class, if it's something least objective, objectionable, or you know you're going to use it, they don't mind paying to, to get a good grade in the class to use the materials. So um, the, the publishers are not helpful in our opinion. They change constantly. Um, they are trying to sell the packages. Um, but I will say that we get, I think we were at 65% of the first of fall, 65% of the adoptions. Yeah. And then we get a stack of syllabus like this. Uh, we're still getting information about textbooks that are being used. And that hurts the students to not know prior to the first day of class. Um, so using it and getting us the information, regardless of whether they purchase it there or it's free or whatever, just so that we can be a, a source to, to answer questions. At the end of every semester, somebody will come back to me to return a book after they've had it for four plus months and say, my professor didn't even make me read this book and I can't get a refund for it. We only had the book for four months. To use it if you're not using it, no, no adoption required. <laughs> um, Carla, do you could you elaborate on your your comment? Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, it's just I get a lot of I survey mine in the summer to ask whether they are planning to purchase textbooks or not purchase textbooks. And I had probably half to two thirds saying not planning on purchasing textbooks. And that was before the class even started. Hmm. Right. And I assume they I assume they followed through on their decision and you know <laughs> didn't, didn't purchase. Um, but that was my sense is that and, and in fact, if I put something on um, an assessment of some sort that wasn't on the PowerPoints, I get nasty feedback. It's like, it wasn't on the PowerPoints, I shouldn't have to know it. I'm like, but it was in the book. This is a direct quote from the book. <laughs> yeah, they don't care. And so. I guess that, that supports what I said, is if, if you're using a textbook, then make it part of the course so that everybody knows that they have to read it or they don't have to read it if it's just PowerPoint, because I wouldn't buy it either if all the information's on the PowerPoint. Um, right, but I want them to read it, and I, I tell them that it's required. I mean, to me, the PowerPoints are supposed to be like an outline. Yep. 
you know, of what's there. And then they read the book for the bigger context for the examples and, you know, figures and, you know, that stuff that's kind of, you know, in the book so that they have the whole picture. But they don't, you know, even though that's what I want, that's not what they want. So, yeah, from my perspective, it's required. I want them to read it. But from their perspective, they don't want to have to read it. They want it to be, you know, in the PowerPoint and stuff like that. So, yeah, I'm kind of stuck between do I want to get good teaching evaluations and, you know, have a class that kind of works with me? Or do I want to hold the line and say, well, you should have read the book because it was in the book. And then, you know, I suffer for it. <laughs> so I, I don't know. It's kind of hard these days to know exactly what the what the path is supposed to be. Absolutely. So um, next up, we have Stacy. Yep, Stacy, you're up next. Well, I'm not, I'm not going to say much. I just you want to just talk about the, the process that, that we do. Um, and then I just had a couple of questions actually for the group because Justin and I would love to love to know a couple of things. Um, one, we send out deadlines. The, the deadlines have been the same. Uh, it's uh, October 15th, which is now for um, uh, many in spring. And then uh, March 15th, which is for summer and fall. And uh, we know those are way early. We know that the university changes their schedule 12,000 times. We know that they haven't assigned the instructors until the week of classes. We know all this. Um, the deadline is not arbitrary. It's set up uh, because of legalities, but also because we're supposed to have all of the materials posted on our website. The we're the department for Towson University that are um, required to post all materials um, on our website so that students can, when they register for classes, they can look at their books and then it'll take them to our website and they'll know how much it's going to cost them to buy their books for the entire semester. So that's what the deadlines are for. Um, in, in case anybody, you know, didn't know, but that that's why it's for registration because students are registering now for many in spring. And in the vast majority of the case, I mean, we're not even at 10%, I don't think. So they were not, really not able to look at the prices of their books. Um, we do put all of the information uh, that you guys are using, or if it's, if it's recommended, please tell us, because we'll put recommended too. Um, we've seen an, uh, an uptake in people um, purchasing recommended materials. Um, I would say the percentage of people that purchase books, uh, Carla, you're right, it's probably 30% maybe. That's, a, that's about what our sell-through is for just regular textbooks. Now for direct access, if you're if you're using it in your class, which is probably about a third of our classes, some are which are just ebooks, some are ebooks with courseware, um, the uh, percentage is 93%. Um, so that's a big difference. Um, we partner with the library. We have been for some time. Uh, giving them uh, the adoptions that we get so that they can look at what their catalog is and whether they can purchase uh, and want to, to have books available for the students. We've also put it on our website. Um, we did it by hand, but uh, this semester we were able to, and I say we loosely, it wasn't me. I asked my IT person who's brilliant, and I said, can you just figure out how to get, you know, the library stuff on our website? And it didn't seem to take her very long, and she got it up. And now when a student uh, looks at a class, not only do they see things for purchase, but they also see whether it's available ebook from the library. Um, or that it's uh, able to uh, come and check out and they can actually go right to the library website, which I think is really cool. Um, so I, I think that that's been really helpful. We like to put up uh, if it's, you know, if it's free materials or whatever, no information is, uh, is turned away. We like all information. Um, and then uh, just if you're having trouble getting uh, the, the 
information about a publisher or want to look at books, we can assist uh, at the university store. We do have people that we can reach out to. We also do, I do um, price negotiations, um, package negotiations, that kind of thing. If that's an issue, it's funny to me that nobody mentioned price in their decision of um, of picking a textbook. And that tracks with what I've found is that uh, more than price at this point, it's it's about usage. Um, nobody likes to buy anything that that they don't you know, use. And I just had one question. Um, if so, I, I'm not sure where you got the twelve hundred per year because that was I I my numbers. It's like closer to seven fifty now. Mm -hmm. That might be um, a few years old. Mm -hmm. uh, and the um, so the, and the average textbook at one hundred five. So when I do my averages of textbooks, it's probably closer to fifty. Only if you take all of the zero cost. And so what's really the real average? So one hundred five seems high to me because our our if we took all of our textbooks, it would be more like um, fifty. If I gave you the average. Um, and you could probably even figure that out with the library having library materials. Um, but the, the digital platform has definitely made a difference in um, what the average price of the textbook are. Although when books disappear, then they charge whatever they want and they'll go right back up to 120. So um, that's my fear. I just had, this is my question I was gonna end is um, if, so, so our big problem besides the usage and getting the information is also the complexities of delivery. So there's regular books, there's uh, there's ebooks, there's ebooks courseware, there's uh, six major publishers that have different access points to those. There's codes, there's you know Cognolearn, and the, there's just like twelve million different ways to get materials. And I spent. Um, 45 minutes with a parent trying to navigate through the six classes that his freshman is taking. And each one had a different uh, price and way that they got the materials. And I went on and up, I thought, I do this for a living. And this was exhausting. So as a, as a, a, a support person for faculty and for students, my question is if we could offer, regardless of the way it was delivered, um, textbooks to students at a $200 a semester blanket cost. Um, would that be something you would be interested in? Um, is it something that the students would be interested in? I'll be sending out surveys because that's kind of where I'm at at this point is you could opt out of the 200 if you found that you were only paying you know, 50. But if you're, if you're spending $1,200 a year on books and you can go from 1200 to 400, um, would that be something that, that would be interesting? Would that be for rental or for ownership? Ownership. I don't want to deal with having to get them back. <laughs> <laughs> so, but then our buyback would be better and we could get, you know, we'd have more used books. So, um, but we've done the work and I, I think I can, what I'm trying to do is get that 93% for the third of the direct access classes to be more across the board so that, you know, faculty know that their students have the materials. I like that idea. I'm just worried about uh, majors like nursing, for example, and the books are very high. Yep. To what extent do you think only 30% of our students buy books through you? I'm going to give the grandma wrong in this question. It's due to them buying them from Amazon and booksellers. So I have a couple of studies that I can share with you. Um, I don't understand what the question is. I guess my question is if they're still finding it cheaper and used on Amazon or on the corner of Tasseltown and York, they might not adopt, they might not elect to do that. And would that still make it cost? Would you still be able to meet the volume that you might need to get that cost? Yes. I figured that in for sure. Yeah, it's been something we've been mulling over for about a year and a half. I will tell you, I am very confident with our pricing. We price match. I mean, we're extremely competitive. Justin and I check Amazon on a daily basis. Um, 
and it's a fact that they jack up the they bring down the prices for the first week of school and then they jack them back up after. So if I can ride through that first week and I do a couple of price match, I mean we've been doing price matching for what seven, eight, ten years, mm -hmm. and maybe I get a handful every year. Yeah. You'd be surprised because you can go on. I've had people price match and I'm like, well, I'm actually cheaper, but if you'd like to pay a couple extra dollars, then I'll do that. So we're pretty confident with our pricing. Can I ask how how much do you think is uh, due to the ebooks versus the old um, paper books that the price has gone down? Um, so the ebook pricing for just an ebook um, is going up. So, so my concern, the, the push for this for this all access thing, started in California. And I've been fighting it for probably four years, but it's gotten so complicated that it would be, the reason why I would do it is because it would be easier for the student and the parent to understand. Um, not because we would make more money. That's not the point. We don't make all that much. I mean, 10% on eBooks, if. Um, so the, the amount of work that goes into it, really, it's not a big payoff. We make, the store makes our money on sweatshirts. Um, so I, I the eBooks, my, my scare with, I'd much rather have a book, but my, my fear with the eBooks is that publishers were fighting the used book market forever and it's dwindling because they're not producing as many books because it's cheaper. I mean, you don't have to print, you don't have to hire people to print. Uh, so when that dries up and not everybody, it will totally, um, but when it dries up, I mean, we're kind of, we're kind of stuck. The negotiation ends. We're going to a textbook affordability conference at the end of the month in Chicago. And I'm on a panel similar to this one and I'll be asking the publishers in the room that have been very uh, vocal uh, nationally about the, the pricing barrel that they have us. We have a Wiley book that um, we adopted and they've, it's been adopted for uh, in what, three years maybe? And they doubled the price. It went from $59 to $130, I think. And I said, whoa, what is with this? And the instructor, of course, was like, well, I've been using this in Wiley Plus, but I don't want to charge the students 50% more and, uh, oh, oh, you know what? We can give you a special price and give you the $59. I would like to know why. You're still making money on the $59. Why automatically can you? But if you can get 130, when it's really only an $8 thing, then you will. So they're not, um, I don't think that they're, uh, publishers in general are as ethical as they should be taking care of the academic market. Seems to be at odds. So we support any kind of way that you get materials. Susan, can I ask, uh, have you seen uh, a decline in the number of custom course packet requests from our faculty over the years? But that's something that comes up. Sometimes faculty will, they only want to use a few chapters from the book. So they don't want students to buy the book and certainly use 20, 30 percent of it. That's more than we can claim fair use of those e reserves. Right. So the only viable option really is to put it in a custom course packet and have the students buy it from the bookstore, and then you guys factor in on the clearance fees and the charge the price you charge the students for the course packets. Um, but I, whenever I tell faculty that, it's always too late because they're coming to me like, "Let's get classes." They post three chapters for book. us too. Yeah, and if it's if it's an ebook that we can buy for unlimited users, great, we can buy it, have it ready available within a few days, and you can link directly to those chapters that you've assigned, but not all books are available for us to buy. They are not. That's the first thing we look for is whether it's available in ebook format. The customer, I mean, I used to have a whole department, you, you know that, uh, completely dedicated to custom course packets, and that just doesn't exist anymore. In fact, my person is now my accounting manager. And I finally told her, I said, are you ever going to throw those packets away? Because they took up a whole room. And I'm like, we're not using them. She's like, well, maybe somebody will. And I'm like, nobody's going to want them. Throw them away. Um, which is sad. I think custom course packs are a good thing. Uh, it's a good option to choose exactly what you're going to teach. Um, 
and students like like them in general because it's something you're using. Um, but it's also if it's something if something is put in a horse packet that the library has in one of our full text databases, like a journal article that you can sign, you could just link to that library copy of the journal article rather than have get put in a course packet that students have to pay clearance fees for. So oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. So it's um it's always useful to check with your liaison librarian or check with Cook Concert to see if we have, especially with the journal article. Um, now book chapters are a little harder, but even those are worth checking. But yeah, see, that's cool. And, well, in this semester, I adopted a lot more links to the library ebooks. Yeah. Uh, as instructors and admins have been emailing and saying, well, we're just going to use this through the Cook Library. Like, okay, so you need to email me what the link is so I can put it on the website. Just because you're using something through the Cook Library doesn't mean I don't need to have something to let the students know what it's going to be. Uh, and so I've seen a sharp increase this semester in that. I like that because even if they're not getting something from me, at least they're giving me the information to show. Because the students are going to the course materials site, your site first, yeah, they sure. to start to see if they need to buy. Yeah. So yeah, having it there is essential. And you'd be surprised uh, how many people, students, know that it's at the library, but they want their own. Because they do. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really liked the idea of the program that the library is doing where they purchase some of the course textbooks for the bigger classes. I thought that was a great idea for my students who, you know, may not want to pay for the book, may not be able to afford to pay for the book. But I ask the people who are, you know, keeping track of the numbers of usage on how many students are actually using those books. And I don't know if it's just, again, my class and my experience, but there were only a couple of instances of using of those books. So, I mean, I don't know if it's different for other classes across campus, maybe the sciences or something, you know, they're more likely to reach out for the books and stuff, but my students didn't seem to be using those. It runs the gamut. From what we've seen, we've seen as many as a few hundred uses for some of the books. Um, it really does depend on the course. Our, our assessment librarian is gathering that that data so that we know how well it's being used to inform future purchase decisions. Yep. So, Trish, you're up next. Oh, sure. Okay, thanks. Good to see everyone. The um, I'll just start at the, the beginning of fastest involvement with OERs was we were co-PI with Jennifer Scott in the PAGS department on a most grant, that's Maryland Open Source Textbook Initiative grant, in, and we won that award as an institutional um, grantee in spring of 2020. Remember what else happened in spring of 2020? Mm -hmm. Everybody went home. <laughs> so it took us a while to kind of get things up and running, but I think we're in, in good shape now. But that that grant proposal and project had several pieces to it. One was establishing an OER community of practice, which um, remains today. We started that um, in spring of 2020. Jennifer Scott was the chair of that for a long time, and Paul Monroe has become the chair of this, this academic year. We're really thrilled to have Paul's leadership there. Um, and this, this group meets a couple of times a semester to help provide support and mentorship for OER um, selection and, and just discussion, um, and then also to kind of make advancements in OER usage and other open source material usage on campus. Around the same time that we got the institutional grant and established the community of practice, we received a charge from the provost office. Um, and this was right after an SGA resolution had come in about course material prices, trying to keep them low. And so Nike Wright, who was the vice provost, and I co-chaired that task force. It was a very brief task force for about maybe eight or 10 weeks. And um, the conclusions the task force came to were really similar to what we had written into the project. So the, the great news was, and that wasn't just because of my involvement on both, but it was just that that, you know, what we had conceived as, you know, with this, this leadership group that wrote the grant proposal, which was made up almost entirely of faculty, some of whom are here, that they really had in mind exactly what was needed to kind of move this forward. And so um, so we had the provost office, you know, supporting our work. Um, we had many grants that we started right away. Uh, that fall or that summer, maybe certainly by early fall of 2020, and we've had um, OER mini grants every semester since. 
And we'll have those again this semester, November 6th will be the call for proposal date. And then we'll have about a month later for the due date. Um, we, we offer $500 exploratory grants and $1,500 adopt adapt grants every semester. And we don't have a limit on, of number. It's really just depending on how competitive the application is. So sometimes we grant two in a semester, sometimes we grant up to eight in a semester, just depending on you know what interest level there is and how competitive those proposals are. So we're really excited now to take on the, the most grant paid for that up until the end of uh, the middle of spring, and then FACET took over the cost. So FACET, um, as a co-PI, wrote in that we would sustain the project after the, the grant funding run out, which it has now. So FACET's happy to keep supporting the mini grant. We also support the COP by paying the chair. Um, and also supporting events like this. So I'm um, really happy to be working on, on those ongoing efforts. The other big thing that came out of the, the grant project was that we, in the proposal, talked about wanting to designate courses as no cost or low cost, whether or not open source material was used. So the, obviously the best practice would be to identify OERs, um, but that isn't always practical. And there are other options that are free and no low cost to the students. Low cost we define as under $50 total for course materials and then no cost is zero cost to students. And so starting in the fall of 2022, we did a pilot that semester um, working with the registrar's office through the spring and summer of that year to um, have the course schedule designate low and, and no cost. And that's actually a searchable attribute on the course schedule, which is really wonderful. And so we had a really good uptake that first fall and not as much uptake for spring. And then this fall, the numbers are still pretty flat. So I think what we have to do is redouble our efforts in talking to the Council of Chairs. In fact, I just wrote a note that um, in my work with the Council of Chairs, I'll talk to the department chairs about that within the next month and make sure that they're aware of the process that we have. It's a really simple process. Um, when you submit your, your course material uh, information to the administrative assistant of the academic department each semester, you just designate if it's low or no cost, or if it's not, you know, if, if there's a cost above $50. And if there's no or low cost, then what we really want to work hard on, uh, and happy to have the use store representation here, is to make sure we're messaging that those links to those low or no cost materials go to the use store so, so that we're all in the same sheets. So it sounds to me like you have the same issues that we do as far as the um, getting the information. Because if you don't have the information, it's going to be flat. And I chase it every single semester. So that's going to be the, the that's the problem is that either they don't know or they don't think about it until it's way too late. I think it's an awareness thing, Stacey. I know in, in the spring, we had several new department chairs. Over the summer, 10 new department chairs came in. And so this is really a time when we want to ramp up that messaging. No, I think that's so, awesome. Yeah, so we'll I wish that, I could we'll get the sure, same information. Yeah, we'll make sure that that comes in. I, I made a note of that as well, to, that the links need to go to Ustore. Um, when, from the administrative assistant so that, that, that we're closing that. Because some departments are better than others. I mean, math will be set. <laughs> Almost at the end of today, I'll be done with math. So they're always great. There are other departments that are not. Yeah. Some for reasons of their of their own and some because <laughs> not their reasons, you know. But my other question would be, uh, you might be missing out on designating uh, quite a few courses as low or no cost if the $50 threshold is what you're looking for. And we could, I mean, if the, so a lot of times, unless if the instructor is using a free material, then obviously no cost, fine. But it would be difficult to know whether it's low cost because it could be under $50 as a rental or an ebook, and then it could be $100 if it's new or whatever. So we could provide you with um, the information of the books that are low cost um, in a spreadsheet or however that you could have more indicators on them. Well, and if it could link to us, that would be helpful. But when I saw that in 2020, I was like, wait a minute, we do that. Um, so we should work together to make sure that information is out for the students because we we have it. Mm -hmm. um, and I could tell you if, and so if something was 52.95, could we get it under 50? You know, there's there's things that, that can happen on our end um, too, to help with designating more because a vast majority of our books are under fifty dollars. Right. Theoretically, we, we, we like get that information 
fairly early. So when it's been integrated into departments, when people are requesting classes, that's when they designate that. So it's, it's really early on in um, um, in the process. They already have an idea of what they want to use, so even if they haven't contacted the client. Yeah, that's the piece that matters. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you very much, Stacey. <laughs> so um, that's all we have from Facet, but I did want to mention that um, the liaison librarians are a big part of the community practice as well. And I, I wonder if Rick, do you want to talk a little bit more about them? Are they college based that don't know as so much? So the liaisons, the they are they are pointed to particular departments or programs on campus. Every program has one as they as a library, at least one liaison librarian. So they they do they help coordinate purchase um, of books and materials for that department. And then they also provide instructional uh you know uh, assistance. Um, and yeah, on these OER grants, they've been, uh, some of them have even been written as like co PIs on the grants, or at least the team members in the grants. Um, they assist the faculty member with finding uh, OER, but the faculty member still has to review and you know, look at closely. But it's such a, it could be like finding you know, a haystack, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But um, yeah, the library is there to help them sort of wade through the vast ocean of OERs that are out there and pointing towards hopefully good sources to check. Thanks for that, Rick. And so I think as I'm as I'm hearing you say that, and you're just reminding me of what I think we talk about all the time, but I think in the call for proposals, I may may make that more evident that the the um, liaison librarians are part of the team, that there's a natural partnership happening there, and we urge you to reach out to them, even in the writing of the proposal, um, let alone the implementation. So that's really helpful. Thank you. Joyce? Well, next. Okay. I brought the props. So can I just add some when you mentioned OER? Uh, this semester I've gotten more OER adoptions from faculty than I've ever had before. Okay. And those are also links that I put on the Ustore website. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just put it uh, I have a thing that I entered so it looks like it's book information, open education resources, and then within that for each class. I can put a link to the materials. Okay, um, hi everyone. My name is Rick Davis. Um, so I'm going to talk about initially the, the, the library's textbook program, which we talked about, which was mentioned earlier. Um, normally, the library does not buy um, textbooks as part of our ongoing collection development work. Um, our, our collection development policy does not allow us to buy textbooks. And by textbooks, what I mean are books that are marketed primarily to the student textbook market. So I brought some examples from our textbook research collection, um, various subjects. You know, they'll typically have you know, a lot of color illustrations, they'll have chapter questions, learning outcomes, that kind of stuff, versus books like these, which are from our stacks, from some of the same call number areas that are just sort of general monographs or, you know, like edited volumes and readings on topics. Um, so in fall 2021, we launched a program um, to buy textbooks, um, and we used uh, primarily foundation money from the TU's Big Give, so the campus, yep. the Big Big Give. Um, and then our dean supplemented that with some extra operating funds she's had. Now we've gone through three rounds of acquisitions since fall, 20, fall 2021, 2022, 2023. So we now have about 400 titles in the collection. Um, these are books that are kept on permanent reserve and they're available for students to check out for a two hour loan period. So students can check it out, read their assigned chapter. They can even go over to one of the library scanners and scan the chapter, take a picture of their phone, whatever they want to do in that two hours. Um, and then uh, use the textbooks that way. Um, so we've, because our funds are limited, we're limited to those donated funds and whatever extra operating funds our dean can pitch in, um, we have to be selective in what we buy. So the criteria that we've been using is we get a list from Stacy of what the bookstore has on hand. This is usually like end of June, right? As the fiscal year is about to end. When you all are doing inventory, which is, <laughs> I appreciate you guys doing this when you're busy with inventory. But we get a list of what they have on hand and then we've used sort of a different, we try to come, look for titles that are, uh, as Carla said, I think, high enrollment uh, courses by those textbooks. We've In the first semester, we bought multiple copies and we found that the multiple copies weren't always used. Um, and then we've also looked at um, the most expensive textbooks. Um, but we have to buy whatever the U store has on hand because we have to get it before the end of the fiscal year plus we're using that end of fiscal year money. Um, so faculty can also um, recommend that their course textbook be purchased for this collection. 
and there's a link on the course books and library page which we're about to show you. So this is another new initiative. Um, so on the library homepage, libraries.towson.edu, if you're using the libraries, this link right here, course books, every semester we create this page, or every term. So we do it for many master and summer as well as spring and fall. Um, and we do this using data that is provided to us by the use store, that textbook adoption info. We get a file that just sent to us automatically every week. So about four to five weeks before the new term is about to begin, we take that version of the adoption data and we search that against our catalog, Code One Search. Basically, we're looking for titles with the same ISBN, matching ISBN. And then when we find them, we list them here on this page. So you can see for the fall, we have a total of 877 listings. Now, some of these are duplicates because we list each course section individually here when they're using the same textbook. But it's a combination of ebooks and print. The print titles includes this collection of 400 or so textbook reserves collections, or textbook reserves types that we've bought, um, as well as other books just out in our stacks that we happen to have. Um, we list those here. Now, we don't put those on reserve. Um, about a week before classes begin, Joyce and her team, they send out emails to all the faculty whose books are listed on this page to let them know your textbook is going to be listed here. Um, and she'll let them know if it's already on reserve, like textbook reserve, or somebody else already put it on regular library reserve, or if it's in the stacks. And if it's in the stacks, she asks them to consider uh, submitting a reserve request. We have to do it. We have to, the faculty have to sort of lead that process and ask to put a title. Now, those titles are put on reserve just for that term. After the term's over, they get returned back to the stacks, unlike the textbook reserves titles that we purchased specifically for the textbook reserves collection through permanent reserves. They never go back to the stacks. Um, and this page you can limit by, um, well, let's see, I, I think I have an example here. This one, I click to it, it goes straight to the uh, Cook One Search record for this particular book. I scroll all the way down here to the location information. It's not displaying for some odd reason. There we go. You'll see that this is in the textbook reserves collection and it's available in two hour loan versus um, needs to work. Here's the title, Software Security. This one, again, we go to the Cook One Search record and you see in the location info that this is in the stacks. So this one was never put on reserve. Um, so basically it's available on the, stack, on the shelf for any first student comes to check it out and check it out. Ideally that would be put on reserve, but especially if it's a large class. I would say it's a gradual level seminar and then maybe it's fine to leave it in the stacks and let the first student get to it if you want to, especially if it's a recommended title rather than a required title. Um, so, and then with the eBooks on the course books page. So now of those 877 listings we have for fall, 317 are eBooks. And you'll see over here, move this, in this note column, we know when it's a limited user eBook because some of our eBooks that we buy are only available to us under that, those terms of use. One simultaneous, one, one, one user at a time or three simultaneous users. Those do not work great for textbook for course use because there's a bottleneck and everyone tries to use the book at the same time. Um, but we list them here anyway. Um, now, the ones that don't have a no are unlimited user, which is always our preferred way of acquiring ebooks when we can. We can't always do that. Um, what else? Yes. Do the ebooks on our like other ebook repositories like the EBSCO one, are, are those limited use or those unlimited use? So the I fact that there's unlimited. There's limited printing, certainly, but, but yeah, that's know, another issue. Yeah, I don't know. So, let's like, talk about that. <laughs> so, the um, the EBSCO faculty selection, which is the other thing I want to talk about today, those are all unlimited user ebooks. Oh, they are. That's, that's why they, they, they've chosen that deliberately so that they are, those are books that are better suited towards course use because they're unlimited user. Some of them are also DRM free, so there's no printing limits. You can retain your copy indefinitely. Um, so that's that's a really nice aspect of that program. But these are just any of our ebooks, maybe from any provider, um, and um, they may not have printing limits, download limits. Now, what we what we've been doing is we've been getting this. As Stacy said, this semester for the first time, we gave her IT person links for what we had on this page, except for the single user ebooks and I think three user ebooks, because we didn't want a student at the point of purchase deciding whether to buy it. To say, oh, the library has that. I'm not going to buy it, and then find out they can't ever get into the ebook because it's only one. <laughs> so we've limited what we've given them at the, this point, but they are listed here on this page. Super um, helpful when we have back orders. 
Because yeah. I'm like, well, we're out of it, but you can yeah. get it. I I sure. well, so, I'll add, I'll so the, can I ask you a yeah, question sure. about that one in three users? Uh, is there a time limit for the one user to have the ebook or the three users to have the ebook? Is it like two hours? Like, um, so we're, we're, we get our ebooks from many different providers. The ProQuest and EBSCO are the two major ebook providers that we use, but we also get ebooks from JSTOR, from Rutledge, from all different kinds of uh, providers, and they all have different settings and terms. What we're trying to do with the one user ebooks is um, we've turned off, we've limited downloads to like, um, I think it's two hours or four hours to, to mimic sort of a print book on reserve. Because yeah, while that person has downloaded that book, because if it's one user title, nobody else can get to it. So we had to limit that. And again, they can, now it doesn't work as well if it's, um, uh, you know, they want to print out, if there's a printing limit on top of that, and they down, you know, they have for two hours, they can read it online within those two hours or log off and log, try to log back into it. So it's it's problematic. That's why those, What's not happening? Yeah, those limited user ebooks are really not well suited to course no. use. They're really meant for research use. Um, but I wanted to show just um, an example of the, in the use store site, one of those links that we provided find my notes for it let's see so here's where students go to search for their courses if i'm looking for this course acsd and this was <laughs> please pick Rick, please pick a class i have a book in the course <laughs> <laughs> my boss is right here <laughs> i was just thinking how pretty is <laughs> So here is the new thing, also available to providers. Right there on the page, the student can see, oh, I can buy this for $170. I get an ebook, uh, lifetime digital rights access. <laughs> or if you go here to the library link, they'll take you again to put one search. And in this case, you'll see here, it's you copy license for unlimited time. So this is this would work perfectly fine for students as long as they're fine using an ebook rather than a print book. Now, if they still want to find a print book. Well, actually, you guys sell the ebook, so they don't have a print book option here unless they buy it. Yeah, Amazon often it's not available anymore. Yeah, right. So this is a good case where you could. So for it. us, we wouldn't. So an ebook, we don't have to worry about paying for it in advance. But we now know if you've got an availability, it'll make a difference of how we spend the university's money in purchasing things. So it works well all around. So that we're more fiscally responsible too. Um, well, and if you have uh, an ebook. I don't need to adopt anything because if, if the students are going to have access to the ebook for free, why am I going to advertise or try to sell them something? Because some of them buy it. Don't tell me that. <laughs> well, I want to show you all of this. There's the link to recommend that your textbook be purchased by the library as part of that Princess Preserves budget. Uh, it's here at the top of the course of the library page. You go here to this link. There's this form with just a few required fields. We ask what your connection so it's the fact that we're teaching the course. Obviously, we're going to give that more weight than I, I mean, we'll, we'll listen to students, obviously. But because, again, our, our funds are limited, um, we most likely won't be able to buy it that semester that you submit the, tech, the, the recommendation. But we'll add it to the queue. And if we can get to it, we certainly will try. Um, and uh, and then if it gets purchased and added to the textbook reserves collection, the faculty who's using it will then be notified when Joyce sends their emails out. It will pass to the end of the semester. Um, I think we've added into our adoption pages. We've added uh, the record. Oh, good. Reserves, because I sent a couple over to you. The other thing I want to talk about was faculty select. Before I do that, are there any other questions about print textbook reserves or our course books in the library page? One other thing I'd like to note is that um, we will also, if a faculty member has um, a spare copy, um, we will also take it. You can donate it to the library or you can put it on reserve from semester to semester. So um, that's also an option as well. And we have gotten a number of titles that way, which is really fantastic. And those can go to the ebook reserve or to the uh, book reserve, the print textbook reserves collection. That's oh. on permanent reserve. Part of that reasoning for that is, I mean, it makes it easier for students to find them, but also these are not books that we would normally put in our collection because they're another text. We don't buy textbooks for a collection. Uh, uh, now, there's a gray line, so that's hard to tell what's a textbook and what isn't. Um, but for the most part, the kinds of things. Plus, we want to be able to uh, make, make sure that collection remains current so that as new editions come out and faculty stop using that edition, we can withdraw the ones that we bought in the past. And, so it's easier to do that when they're in that limited collection. 
would you be interested in additions that we're not using anymore? Sometimes we destroy things that um, can have no return. But they're still being used in courses? Or? It depends. It could show up in a, so it could not be used in a semester or be used another semester. But we, I, I, I mean, the, the criteria for us is whether it's still being used in the course on campus. Uh, yeah. If it is, then we will certainly love to add it to our collection. But um, that goes for the faculty donations, too. Um, we can't really use it against an old edition. That's not going to be used in the course because it's not something part of the collection. Gotcha. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So faculty select is the other thing I want to talk about. And you can find this uh, in the Cook One Search banner here at the top. You'll see a link to it under faculty select. It's also in the library's uh, A to Z databases page. You go to the F page and you see faculty select. But I'll click this link here just to save some time. When you click it, you go to this interview. You can click, you can click here to not see this page in the future, but want to hear it. And so Faculty Select, again, is a, it's a very similar interface. In fact, if I go to the advanced search, it looks very similar to the, the one search interface. Um, it's an EBSCO product. And what this does is it allows you to search for a limited, limited sort of corpus of books that are either unlimited user ebooks at the library you can ask the library to purchase, or they're open access books that are free, freely available, or they're OER, you know, open textbooks. And the open textbooks is searching about seven to eight different repositories. Um, repositories like the Open Library, Press Books Directory, Open Textbook Library, OpenStax, uh, Milne Open Textbook, which is the new name of the SUNY Open Textbook Program, and BC Open Textbook Project. Um, so what you do, once you do your search, I'll just put in a search for, um, and I can, it does autocomplete, let me change. So you'll see over here on the left with my limiters, um, I can limit to just the OER. So first of all, with my search, I got over 7,200 results. Um, I can limit to just OER, the open access eBooks, or eBooks that you can ask the library to purchase. So if I start with OER, so I go down to 981 titles, and this will give you a link to preview the textbook, and it usually goes to whatever repository is hosting it. You can, any, if you adopt it, you can fill out a form, they'll send you a, what they call a course-friendly link that you can copy and paste in the Blackboard. But really, you can just use the link that's provided by the repository when you go there. Um, so those are pretty straightforward. If I instead limit my results to- So Rick, if they this, adopt it, where does it go? So, um, let me go back to that. This says adopt. It's just, um, I think they report that, they pass it on to us. Um, yeah, so this is where you, so if you, if you were to preview it, I'll open this in new tab. It'll take me for this particular title, this one is hosted on, so it loads, I'll know. It's an open textbook library title. Yeah. So I could, if there's, if there's a persistent URL, I just use the link here. I could just use that link, but this allows you to look through it. They have the different formats that are available for this particular title. Um, are you guys seeing this in the share? Is it open in the new? I think so. Okay. Yep. Anyway, that's what I showed the reason. And then if you click on the request a course friendly link, then it'll send you a permanent link to the title, but you can get that from the site. So, so I don't know if that's really, that's a good question. I don't know if they're reporting that to us or not. We haven't had too many people use this. Yeah. yeah. If they're getting um, a link and they're putting it in their syllabus, yeah, and share it. Yeah, I, I would just if could you just send yeah. it over to yeah. us? I'll I'll check on that. Make yeah, sure. so we can get that data, and if we can, we'll share it with you. That'd be super cool. Yes, okay. right. question. Yeah. So suppose you find the PDF of that, and you make a copy and put it in your Blackboard. Yeah. So right. all the textbooks are totally openly licensed. You can do anything you want with them. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and they will well, usually have anything. Miranda talk about licensing. Yeah, it means glad or not about that. Yeah. They'll <laughs> <laughs> have term, but it's very, it's like, you know, you can use this, you can copy, you can remix it, as long as you provide credit to the authors or whatever. It's very basic, you know, requirement. Yeah. But yeah, that's the whole point of the, and you can do a lot more with those, like, uh, as compared to the open access ebooks that you can also find in fact, it's like, those are not open act. Those are open access, but not openly licensed. Yeah. So they're still under copyright. You can't remix them. You can't, you know, build upon them the same way you can with the OER textbooks. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, the, the reason I ask is because I think sometimes the website that's hosting it doesn't last forever. 
Yeah. And so you grab the PDF, put it in your in your um, you know, your hard drive, whatever, right. yeah. and you have that book from now on. And if, yeah. if it goes down, you don't need to worry about them linking to it. The only problem with that is you don't see the updates of somebody because again, these open yeah. license titles, anyone yeah. can update them and add to them. Um, so you lose that aspect of it. If you're going to like a big repository like OpenStax or the Open Textbook Library, they're going to be pretty permanent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So the publishers, yeah. publishers are not they're not archives. They're they're they, they like changing stuff around. Yeah, yeah. File locations. Sure. So which one would preserve the content best? Then, and also a question about the accessibility of the PDF. So yeah, there are that's what a lot of these have different formats um, that are more accessible than PDFs and like EPUBs and other um, accessible formats. It varies by title. Um, and the permits you asked. Um, so yeah, that, that's been an ongoing issue because we don't really, like if one of our faculty member wants to, faculty members wants to um, use an open textbook and they want to add a chapter of their own to it to supplement it, or they want to revise a chapter, we don't really have a place for them to store that version. Um, they can store it in their hard drive, like Paul said, um, but that's not a permanent long-term solution. Um, so that's kind of been, we talked about this a little bit in the, in the COP. Um, it's an open question. I don't know where we're going to switch with that. Yeah. And now you do version control and all that stuff. Um, so, you know, I guess what I would say is if you're using a particular open textbook, whether you modify it or not, I would check to see what, uh, you know, find the, there are many official copies, but find a copy in a trusted repository and see if it shows you what changes have been made since the last time you used that textbook. Whether you want to incorporate the change, you can just download that version, use that copy. And from one other suggestion I have, yeah. which really caught my attention, was if you're going to if you're going to grab the PDF, grab the HTML link too, giving giving the students both options. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're right. Yeah. Well, and my um, another question is, it literally says adopt this ebook. Mm -hmm. So, how many people think that they've adopted? Mm -hmm. Because, you mean thinking that it goes to you? Because in my mind, if I had adopt this and it's and then I've got the information, then why would why would you tell me? Right. Yeah. So that language is not we may be able to get that that link text changed. Yeah. Something that's a little less confusing. That's a good point. Yeah. Um or we maybe can add a note saying, please notify the bookstore if you adopt this test, something like that. You can add it in the form or whatever. Uh, I hadn't thought of that. That's a good point. Um, if I show you the, if I limit my results to the ebooks available for purchase, again, these are unlimited user ebooks suitable for course use. Some of them are DRM free, not all of them. But again, you can um, preview it. This will take you to, um, these are all EBSCO ebooks. You get the EBSCO platform to preview it. So you can preview it. And then if you decide you want to, if you previewed it, you want to ask us to buy that, you can click this. Uh, Link here, request to purchase from your library. Again, we have a short form. Um, and we when we buy these books at the request of a faculty member, we do use your department's allocation, your library funds for this. Mm -hmm. But we notify your department's rep, faculty rep. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we might copy the liaison too. But um, and we give them uh, 48 hours, either the requesting faculty member or their department's faculty rep to the library, 48 hours to say, no, never mind, don't buy this ebook. You want to spend money on this. Um, so we give you an opt out, but it's basically if we don't hear from you forty years, we're going to buy with your your collection funds. So, um, and that prices range. I don't have an average price. Ebook prices, you know, they can go anywhere from forty fifty dollars up to three hundred dollars. That all depends on the title. And I was going to say also, in addition to the fact that a lot of ebooks we can only buy under limited user licenses, things like these again, textbooks marketed primarily to the textbook market. These aren't available for libraries to purchase, even as single user ebooks. Mm -hmm. These are only for students. So we don't, we don't, we can't buy titles like this. Um, so um, that's something else to bear in mind. Um, but again, you fill this form, we will then get back to you um, and let you know what the price is and give you 48 hours to decide whether you want to opt out or not. You can't buy them, but we can donate them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. Well, and we can we can buy well no ebooks. I'm talking about we can't oh, buy ebooks. E yeah, got it, got it. Um, so we can buy the print textbooks as we've done, uh, but yeah. e ebooks are not matter. Um, and what was I going to say? Faculty select. Um, I guess that's it. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> if you if you need help using it, 
uh, anyone can feel free to reach out to me or you can reach out to your liaison librarian. Now this is a product, faculty select is an EBSCO product that we, we got for free as part of uh, the USMEI Libraries Consortium. And we have access through June, 2024. I suspect we'll probably renew that one way or the other going forward, um, but we at least have it for that long. Um, you know, for EBSCO, it's a way for them to sell eBooks. They're, they're, they have an interest in make, providing it to us. So I'm sure that we'll continue to have access to some version of this. Um, but please check it out. We haven't got as much usage out of it as we'd like to, and I think it's a really great way to find both uh, OER titles and eBooks suitable for course use. The limited user eBooks purchase. And then once we get, well, that's what I was saying. When we buy the eBook, we do buy it. Forty eight hours goes by. You don't opt out. We buy it. We will send you a link. So the, the requesting faculty member the link to the eBook once it's available. So we make that black for you when come to. Thank you. Miranda, you're up next. Yep. Yay. Okay. So we already. Oh. Display settings. Is this or it's the display settings. Oh, it, that makes swap for that. Yep, much better. Okay, um, so we've already talked about this a little bit. Um, we talked a bit about licensing, but um, for those who talk, we, this is like called a textbook. We're talking, we talk a lot about textbooks, but when we say that a lot of the time, what we're really talking about is course materials. It's all just sorts of stuff that ends up getting used for classes, required or optional reading. So it might be commercial textbooks, which Thank you, Rick, for bringing props because now I can just say that thing is on the floor. Um, it might be like an all inclusive courseware situation, it might be library resources. You could just be linking to news articles. You have OER, other openly available content. You may or may not be a hard copy. You may or may not be able to embed it in blackboards. There's lots of different versions of stuff. My guess is in a lot of cases, we're kind of cobbling together these different resources that we have rather than being like, okay, this is the one book. Um, so this kind of, uh, I think is a good, I move this so we can actually see, um, uh, like chart that's kind of describing the differences between uh, like commercial textbooks, what library resources are, and then what open educational resources are specifically, and looking at it as a cost to students versus um, like what your permissions are. So I, Rick touched on this a bit, which is helpful. Commercial textbooks cost to students as expensive, um, which I mean might be expensive, might be sort of like, oh, it's under $50, but it's it's an expense at all versus I'm not having to pay for it. Um, and then what the permissions are. So like we were talking about before, um, like library resources are free, but they are still all rights reserved content. You can't make changes in there. Um, open educational resources, you can. I'll, I'll talk about what the five R's are in a bit, um, because that, that pertains to licensing. Um, so some things about course materials and copyright. I keep moving this so I can see what I wrote. Um, some content might be free to access, but is still all rights reserved. That was um, the sort of library ebooks we've been talking about. So you can't print as much as you want. In most cases, you can't sort of make and distribute unlimited copies. Um, I mean, sometimes you might say it's fair use to use this or use this amount of something, but fair use is just sort of like a, a thing you can claim, but it's not really like, there's no specific guidelines about what is and what isn't fair use. Um, so it might be, it might not be, it might not be and you might not get caught and then it's fine, but sometimes it's better to just have like, okay, I know I'm allowed to actually do this. Um, which is what you get with OER and some other open content because they do work within copyright, not outside of it. Usually they're using an open license like Creative Commons, but that's going to give you very specific stipulations about like what you can and cannot do with it. Um, and then in other cases, some content may be online and or free of cost. That doesn't necessarily make it OER. So there are some Creative Commons licenses and other open licenses that don't permit distribution of um, derivative works. And that's sort of one of the core pieces of OER is that you're able to make changes and um, make another version of something and share that. Um, and I'll talk a bit about the five R's shortly, actually right now, because this is sort of the most commonly accepted definition of what makes something OER rather than just generally openly accessible. Um, so the five R's 
are uh, to retain so you can keep it. You can make as many copies as you want. You're allowed to have it. You can reuse it. So you can use it to teach a course. You can make some other version of it, give it to a, a study group. You can use it for different sorts of uh, purposes. Um, revise, you can adapt or modify it. Um, so like you uh, were saying, sometimes there's some chapters of a book that are awesome and then one that's less than stellar and maybe you just wanna cut that out. Maybe there's like another version of it somewhere um, or you wanna make some changes to it. You are allowed to do that. You're also allowed to translate it into different languages, which I think is cool. Um, yeah, and then remix um, is combining it with other material to create a new work. So this can be, you're making a collection and um, or it can be you're kind of like synthesizing different pieces together to make something new um, and that you're allowed to redistribute that um, so you can share copies with whoever of the original or and and or of any changes you make and or of any derivatives you make um, so that's also helpful for if you're teaching something where the information changes um, I know like this isn't so much a problem anymore but I think it was when I was in school is that there weren't a lot of like ebooks you could get it was mostly print books but by the time you get the textbook published and distributed it's basically already out of date um so you know you can update things with more current information um and then a bit more about licensing you can share it in blackboard or online or wherever without worrying about copyright violations since your distribution and reuse guidelines are clear i'll talk a bit about the licenses uh, at the end of this slide um one thing that's important to note is that um when it's saying like oh you can edit this it doesn't mean the technical ability like there is stuff you you can edit i mean you can even take a book and put white out on a page and write over it, but you're not like legally allowed to do that. Um, so this is pertaining to the legal ability to do it. Um, <laughs> I mean, technically, technically, yes. But yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to tell you it is, uh, it is illegal. Um, usually they're going to be using Creative Commons licenses. That's the most common one, um, but it's another license. In this case, I'm saying that permits distribution of derivative works because that's that's part of one of the five R's. Um, so I would, I would kind of stick to that definition. The four that are going to let you do that are CC BY, which is the attribution license. I think the example we looked at had that one. Um, you might also see uh, CC BY uh, share alike, which also means you have to release whatever derivative you're making under like the same or similar compatible license terms. That part can get a little complicated. So if you don't want to like get too deep into that, I am always happy to look into that for you. Um, uh, you could also release it under a non-commercial one and then or the attribution non-commercial share like um, there are two creative commons licenses that um, have ND which is no derivatives none of those are going to work um, anything that's in the public domain you can also use um, I put a star there because like not every single thing that's in the public domain here is in the public domain in every country. Or you, another thing you can do too is if you can create something and you dedicate it to the public domain, not every country in the world like recognizes that. You're probably not gonna run into that like for these purposes, but I feel like I have to say it anyway. Um, there are also other types of open licenses. So there's like the new, which is a free software license, may or may not pertain in that case. I'm just saying it doesn't have to be Creative Commons, but most of the time it's going to be. Um, and then this is a fun chart saying like what you are able to remix with what. Again, I'm happy to look at these things for you so you do not have to. Um, but you don't want any of the ones with the little equal sign, which is no derivatives. Um, oh good, my I changed the colors of my links and it didn't update. So yeah. We're gonna find out what's in here. So we're kind of talking a bit about where these things live. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we're not seeing your screen share online. Uh, Might be staring the wrong screen. Uh, do you see the slide? We see just your slide deck. We're not seeing your slides, so you might just be sharing like the wrong screen. You say stop, stop sharing, and then reshare. Yeah. Okay. I saw the screen. It said um, has your slides instead of enable content. Oh, okay. Interesting. Oh, Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> no, no, you're Thank good. Um, um, okay, I still have it open. I can share from here. Or you want to zoom? Yeah, the same. Oh, yeah. yeah. Back, yeah. Back, there you go. Share, share. There you go. And go oh, back to that view. Okay. This, or do I just have a slash? Um, one below that. That one. Yeah. Yes, I think this is the. Like that's the email. That's, yeah, that's the that's <laughs> the email. Yeah. 
just gonna reshare. Do you see this now? Where's so I'm that? seeing. I'm still seeing the PowerPoint slides that say "Enable Editing" that window with the protective view yes. banner. Yeah, that yeah. is what I'm showing. Um, okay. Okay. Great. You're not in show mode. Right. I'm not in show mode. Uh -huh. Okay. Before we weren't even seeing the slides, so thank you. That's better. Oh, got you. Okay. Um, I'm. I'm just gonna leave it here because I'm gonna open stuff up. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, where do these things live? They might live sort of online or in repositories. Again, you can download them, they might be on your computer. Um, they might also be in physical spaces because you're allowed to print this stuff out if you want. And now I'm realizing I probably need to stop share and then reshare just screen one because I'm opening stuff up online. Um, okay. So um one of these they need to have a show a show them to put the link. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so one of these places um is OER Commons. A big one. I know faculty select will search this. Um, there are sort of authoring platforms in here, and you can use the editors, um, which is helpful. So that that is one I recommend. There's a few other platforms. I I'll probably just send these out to everyone who registered, and you can like produce them on your own time if you'd like. The other thing I wanted to point out um, is our library guide. Um, so the where to find is going to link to things like um, faculty select, but we also have like a publishing tab in here that's gonna go to some different options of where you can put things most like to like age 5 p which we'll hear more about in a moment. Um, and then like the press books guide. So if you wanna use press books or something like that. Okay, so you know, we keep saying textbooks and then I go back to the, uh, the phrase you might be wondering like what makes these materials, textbook, we did look at some of the examples. Um, and a lot of them will look like that. Um, so they they can be sort of textbooks that we think of in the traditional sense, but it doesn't have to be. So a lot of other things fall under the OER umbrella. So we might have videos or quizzes or online activities, something you might make with H5P. Um, it, it might be text, could be like games or in-class activities. I know when you search some of these repositories, they'll give you like lesson plans or instructions for an activity. Um, an entire course can be OER. Um, you, we do use the phrase open textbook a lot, and it's usually going to describe a collection of OER that have been arranged to look like a traditional textbook because that's easy to understand, um, but it doesn't all have to come from the same source or the same author. You also don't have to make it completely from scratch, which I think some people will be like, I don't know if I want to do this. I don't want to sit there and write that. You can, if you really want to, you can. If you get a grant, then that's cool. You could you could do that. Um, but I wouldn't I wouldn't do it just on your own time for free, probably because it can be really time consuming and challenging. Um, so some final thoughts. One thing that we'll talk a bit more about in a bit. Um, the accessibility a lot of times can be better than commercial resources. Um, I know a lot of them you can get in like an EPUB 3 format now, which is compatible with screen readers and braille displays and offline use, which is pretty cool. Um, saving our students money is great. Um, and also as far as like evaluating things, um, I mean, you know what's best for your course. You know whether it's going to be effective for um, what you're trying to teach your students or not. Um, you hopefully are evaluating it the same way you'd evaluate um, things from a commercial publisher. Um, the other thing that's nice is the flexibility. So you can use as much or as little as you want. Um, you can make changes to things you don't necessarily love. Um, you don't have to write an entire book from scratch. Again, you can sort of like pick and choose and cobble things together. You can use it to supplement a traditionally published book, things like that. So. Uh, if you have licensing questions, I'm always happy to answer them because I know that part is often like the least interesting part probably to most people, but it's interesting to me. Um, but it can get kind of complicated if we go back to that chart that has what's compatible with what. And that's only for two sources. So what if you're trying to do three or more? Um, so generally, though, if you find a bunch of stuff that's um, all CC by, you can just do whatever you want with it. So that the attribution license is kind of the easiest to edit. Um, it's just when you get into like stipulations about share alike or um, that that it becomes a little bit more complicated. Um, 
four or five so that's all I have to so thank you Miranda sorry I was not showing you my slides before online I will share it um, with you later. <laughs> and for me. Sure. So, hi, everyone. I know most of you here, which is great as we are nearing the end of our time together. Um, I am the Learning Technologies Librarian, and I am part of Library IT, which manages um, and owns the um, institution's subscription to H5P, which is um, an open access content creation tool. And I will, I think your email was um, available to share, wasn't it? I just sent you a link. So some of you may know what H5P does. For those of you who don't, I just wanted to share a very quick example. And um, our folks online seeing a uh, library guide that says tech tools can i get a thumbs up from someone online okay yes yes you. so um you can create a bunch of different kinds of things h5p has it's you're able to embed this pretty much anywhere that you want as a link with the html embed code so it can go on blackboard it can go on a web page it can go um it can work with some of those OER textbook creation platforms such as B Press Books. Um, and so it's it's a really versatile tool to use in terms of distribution. And it's also very versatile, versatile in terms of creation. You have synchronous options for engagement and asynchronous options for engagement. So you can do things like course presentations, um, which include multiple content types. So we have just text. We have sort of flashcards, um, and then you have some yes and no, true and false, you know, various style of questions. Um, and so this is, this becomes a word cloud, I believe. I don't know if it's actually, if I submit now. Okay, so I would need to be signed into H5P to actually share with you that result, but it would become a word cloud. Here we have an emoji poll. Um, this is an accordion, a drop down, which you can embed additional links within. Um, image hotspots. You can include text, you can include links, you can include video, audio. Um, again, accessibility of these sort of goes back to the metadata that you put in. So we think about PDFs, they're only as accessible as you make them. Same here with our H5P creations. Um, this image hotspot can be accessible assuming we add things like alt text. Um, and some things, um, if we think about just sort of creating a web page, this is, um, it can be shared again on its own. I've taken a whole bunch of various resources and just put them in a single space, so it's hard to tell where one ends and another one begins. But this is a column, which is essentially a web page, and you can do things like images, text. This one's pretty fun. Um, it's called a summary statement, and um, once you go through this, you create a summary here that reads back to you. You know, um, so it's like a an interactive thing, but you create your own summary in, in essence. Um, and then we just have very popular multiple choice sort of questions. Um, so H5P is has passed the OTS um, security and accessibility reviews um, and has um, a Blackboard integration. And um, as I said, Library IT is the owner of this license. So if folks are interested in um, playing with H5P, first, there is a free version that anyone can use. That is h5p.org. Um, there are limited content types. So each of these things that I scroll through here is a content type. Um, 
there's still a good variety, but again, it's the free version. They want you to pay. And so if you decide after a while that you are interested in getting a license for yourself, your department, college, et cetera, um, that cost is about 170. It decreases the more um, users we get. And so um, they can contact myself um, and library IT will work with you, your department chair, um, to explore implementation. And then we sort of maintain the, the technical back end. Um, so any, that's a lot um, of possible things that you can do with this tool, but any immediate questions? about what it is or oh, yeah. so you so it's to create course content yes but it could be used for other things absolutely so if i were to do a survey regarding that would be a much more interactive better way and then you could get a link and then share that correct, correct? Mm -hmm. yeah so i I've, I've shared all of these as you know i've embedded them but absolutely there are links to each of these I'll individual things that. that's awesome great and like I said, h5p.org is free. Um, h5p.com is the paid service. But um, anyone, and you can request a free trial yep. that lasts 30 days of the paid version. So yeah, you just create your free account um, and you can request. I would play around with it a little bit first and then request, you know, start your 30 day trial um, just that will, you know, make sh that'll sort of prime you for um, a more focused play. Thanks. Okay, and so feel free to get in touch with me, um, and I can answer your questions or put you in touch with other folks who are able to answer your questions. I don't know, Joyce, did you want to wrap it up for us? Well, thanks everyone today for attending this workshop. Um, this session will go up on um, the library's YouTube um, channel. And it's my intention to share it out a little bit more broadly with our colleagues um, who couldn't be here today, especially as we're in the adoption season right now is prime time. Um, so to you know, I ask you to please encourage your colleagues to get their adoptions in because um, that that benefits all of us. So thank you very much for attending today. And thank you again to FACET and the U Store um, and to my library colleagues for sharing their knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.